Uh, yes, I wanted to ask you about these uh, free trade or yeah. well, so-called free trade agreements. And, of course, the TPP in particular, now that it's been released November the 5th, uh, several thousand, over 5,000 pages of, well, quite frankly, legal jargon. Um, so there are also the TTIP, which is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is still being secretly negotiated. And uh, we have the TISA, the uh, Trade in Services Agreement, which is uh, coming down the road as well. So I really wanted to ask you about the TPP of course, because that's the one that we have access to now. Now, you wrote a piece at your blog about 10 days ago called The re of Western Peoples, and uh, you linked to a powerful piece by Chris Hedges called The Most Brazen Corporate Power Grab in American History. It does a really good job, I think, of pointing out just how devastating this TPP looks like it's going to be if it does, in fact, get accepted by the U.S. Congress, which it looks like it's going to under this fast-track yeah. legislation. Now, we did have an interview here on TMR about this last last year with a UK film director, David Malone, went into quite a lot of detail about this. So I'm going to say to people, please go back and listen to that uh, initial interview there. But, uh, you know, you said this was something that you've been meaning to write about at length. So I'm going to invite you, please, would you share your thoughts about this TPP with us now on this program? Yes, it has nothing whatsoever to do with trade. They use trade because they can associate that with free trade which they have everybody brainwashed to think is good and everybody benefits. But it has nothing whatsoever to do with trade. What these partnerships do, both the Atlantic and the Pacific, what they do is they make the global corporations immune to the laws of the country in which they do business because any law that interferes with the corporation can be said to be a restraint on trade particularly if it adversely affects the profits of the corporation. So what these partnerships are and are intended to be is to make corporations immune to the law of sovereign countries. Indeed, further, it puts the sovereign countries under the control of corporate tribunals who can rule, for example, that the French laws against GMOs are restraints of trade, and these corporate tribunals are higher law than the French government and can fine the French government for these laws, can sue the French government for these laws. Anything that interferes with the profit of a global corporation is defined as a restraint on trade, illegal, and the Sovereign, so-called sovereign government responsible is subject to retribution, financial retribution from the corporate tribunals who sit above the sovereign law of the countries. That's what the partnerships do. Why would anyone agree to this? Because they're paid off. Every one of the negotiators was paid off. You linked to a very remarkable article by uh, Paula Casala in Op-Ed News from 20th of June. And she lists uh, the data here about who was paid what. And uh, there are representatives who voted yes, were paid, she says, $197 million. For the no's, uh, they were paid $23 million. So it's very clear where the weighting is on that one. Well, that is about uh, the fast-track decision that Congress made. And this is about the payoffs in terms of political contributions to the re-election funds of the representatives and senators paid by the corporations that favored the partnerships. And the small amount of money that uh, was paid to the people who voted against it, these are from environmental type organizations opposed to GMOs and that sort of thing. And so, yes, the Congress was paid off with political contributions to grant the fast track. And what fast track means is it means that the U.S. trade representative, that is a corporate agent, can make the agreements with corporate agents of the other countries in secret. And then when the agreement is made, they go to the respective legislatures of the various countries involved in the agreement to be voted on. And of course, then they'll all be paid off again to vote for it. The payments I was referring to in our conversation now is that each of the representatives 
from the countries who were negotiating with the U.S. trade representative, they were paid off. And that's how you get a situation where countries agree to give away their sovereignty to corporations. It's impossible for this agreement to go through as they are constructed and not have the loss of the sovereignty of the countries to the corporations. That's what the purpose of the agreement is. It's to make the corporations the rulers of the countries. All the other talk is beside the point, and there are many things to get upset about. But to talk about all these other things, it screams what the real thrust is. And the real thrust is that, for example, as I said, the French GMO laws have to be struck from the book. And any other laws that interfere with what corporations want to do. Mm. The real engine of this seems to be the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement Clauses that uh, are embedded in this. So if a corporation has invested in a particular country and that country brings about policy that that corporation feels has in some way damaged what profits it expected to make, then according to this particular legislation, it can then sue that country. That's the particular offence, isn't it, yes. this ISDS clause? Yes. Uh-huh. And I think, too, that it's not up to the country's courts. These partnerships, as they're called, set up tribunals staffed by the corporations themselves that make the ruling. That's the way I read it and understand it. And so, in effect, it basically means the 1% takes the rest of the control. There's nothing left after that. So the, the, these tribunals are, you said there are three people, and they're making the decision on this kind of thing. Yes, I think that's the way it is. Well, David Malone, who was on the program, now let me just quote from him, because he echoes what you say. Quote, arbitration works as follows. Three arbitrators will be chosen. One, one by, by the, the company, company that's, that's taking the nation to arbitration. Second one by the, the nation to defend it. And the third one will be agreed upon by the first two arbitrators. If they can't agree, there's a mechanism for someone just choosing the third arbitrator for you. Those three people, and they are just people, they are private individuals, almost exclusively drawn from the top 15 global law firms, companies like Freshfields, which are vast. They are a small group of international lawyers drawn from those companies. Those three people, mostly men, mostly European or American, meet behind closed doors. They don't have to publish what evidence was uh, adduced, who gave that evidence, what they said, and they don't have to justify their decision. They don't have to give you a written statement of why they decided in favor of the company or in favor of the nation. And there is no appeals process. And you, as a, a member of a nation, have, and this I'm quoting from someone, ha you have no rights within that process. That's a quote from a law professor who's an expert on arbitration. No rights. rights. No rights in this process. Right. That's exactly correct. Uh, and keep in mind that these, these law firms are the law firms that serve the corporations. So they're not, in any sense, independent either, because all their revenues come from representing the corporations. So that's exactly the case. That's what I said. It simply means... Uh, government is dispensed with. There's no point in having presidents, prime ministers, parliaments, or even courts, because all decisions are now made by the corporations, and they have total control of the outcome and don't have to give any accounting of how they make decisions. So what you read is correct. That person is correct, and that's the intent of these partnerships. And again, how much of this is the media telling you? Mm, virtually nothing. Nothing. Yes, indeed. Well, I've mentioned yes. it to people in my own you know, social life, and they just look at you blankly. Yeah, <laughs> <I know. laughs> there are a couple of other things that I wanted to just bring to attention. Uh, James Corbett's written a piece about this with International Forecast, uh, three particular ways in which the TPP, he says, even worse than we imagined, and he just picks out three things here, interpreting the legal jargon. Uh, a couple of things here I noted, one was copyright and uh, IP, and he says that under this agreement, then the TPP privileges the complainer so that 
ISPs will be obliged to take down material that's complained against uh, for copyright reasons uh, just by default. So even if it's fair use copyrighted material, it can be just taken down if somebody complains about it. And then, of course, the person who's had the material taken down will need to go through lengthy processes, you know, to reinstate that. So, I mean, that obviously means that corporations, governments can just hide whatever information they don't like, even if it's used under fair use. Right. Exactly. Another one which he uh, pointed to is food safety, which you've also mentioned, but uh, he notes that imports will be, uh, you'll have to object to an import based on objective science, which is very vague, and I can't help thinking that means establishment science, so, you know, entities like the FDA will need to define what is objective, you know, Um, so, I mean, just having grounds for concern won't matter. You actually can have to prove on the, the basis of what these establishment bodies would say is proof that a product is unsafe. So the onus is on you to prove that things are unsafe to consume, which is, you know, to, to my mind, is completely the opposite of what it should be. So this all sounds extremely bad. Yes, it is. And it'll go through because the corporations will pay off the crooked politicians and they'll take the money and let it go through. That's exactly what will happen. You have to understand what this basically means is that we've moved to a higher form of tyranny. This is tyranny beyond anything that uh, George Orwell could imagine, and, and, or fascism or anything of the sort. This is, this is rule by money. The top, the 1%, or actually the one-tenth of 1%. This is rule by them on the basis of money and money alone. And it's devoid of any concept of justice or mercy or fairness or, you know, concern for others. Uh, it's driven by maximizing the bottom line. And uh, what this shows is that in the end, uh, capitalism becomes the most tyrannical of all systems. It becomes a political system in itself and a tyrannical and more so even than kings once were or, or Roman emperors because there's no check on the power of the corporations. All restraints on the power of corporations are removed and gone. No restraint of law, no restraint of democracy, no restraint of morality. It's total freedom of corporations to loot, extract whatever they want. What do you make of the, I think, rather lame claim that this is going to be good for people's wages and for employment? It's a lie, like everything else. It's uh, just another lie. I mean, it does seem to me to be implausible. I would have thought that it would lead to more and more offshoring, more unemployment, and, you know, downward pressure on wages because of international competition. Well, uh, the corporations can rule that minimum wage laws adversely affect their products and have to be repealed. So there can't be any labor laws under partnerships. Labor laws are passe. They're overturned. Just like laws against GMOs are overturned. There can't be any law the corporation has to supply any kind of benefits, medical coverage or pensions or or accept unions. I mean, the corporations can say, I will pay 10 cents an hour. That's it. Anything else adversely affects our profits. They they can do whatever they want. It's a dictatorship of one-tenth of the 1%. And now the question is, since Russia and China are not part of this, what are the consequences? The BRICS are in it. South America is not. What do we have? We have a situation where in the so-called democratic world, that is, Washington's European and Asian puppets, like Japan, Korea, and of course the Europeans, they live in total tyranny by what happens with Russia and China and the BRICS. They're not brought into this system. So you have two different worlds, and they don't interact. So we're getting a kind of Eurasia and Oceania situation. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what you're getting. And, of course, you can't talk about this or get any discussion because corporations don't want the media to talk about it. If they do, they pull their advertising and the media dies. So the corporations have the same control over the media that governments do. You see, in the United States, 90% of the media belongs to six mega companies. 
the value of the companies is their federal broadcast licenses and their advertising revenues. If they go against the government, the federal broadcast licenses might not be renewed, in which case companies worth billions and billions of dollars fall to zero net worth. If, on the other hand, they annoy the people who provide the advertising revenues by exposing these partnerships or anything of the sort, there go the advertising revenues. And so the revenues fall, their costs up, they're bankrupt. Yeah. So the media essentially has, the Western media has no independence. None. Yes, it's Noam Chomsky, isn't it, who describes corporations as, as being psychopathic in uh, structure. And uh, it looks to me as if they're somehow sort of projecting that psychopathy onto the whole globe, really, as just a sort of a structural reality of their existence. You know, it doesn't need a huge conspiracy to bring this about. If that's what corporations are like in the way they actually function, then if they go global, then they do that to the whole world. Exactly. Exactly. You know, mankind faces uh, enormous number of crises about which people are essentially ignorant and have no idea. And you can't tell them. Certainly the media will not tell them. Well, of course, the alternative media can, but then, of course, it's very easy to say, well, we'll dismiss the alternative media because they're just a bunch of conspiracy theorists. Right, right. Mm. They're conspiracy theorists. That's right. The other thing I did want to ask you just very briefly about is the TISA, which sounds really quite frightening in its own way, um, where service industry um, is going to be liberalized so that governments are going to find it harder and harder to actually provide public services. And uh, I've read that the U.S. Postal Service is most likely to become privatized in various ways. Now, I would turn to the European Commission's website to see what the EU uh, is saying about this. And they say... This is what they say, that uh, education, health, social services, water, TV, and of course, justice, police, etc., are going to be protected in various ways. You know, and they're, they're very positive about that. It's a sort of Q&A. Will, will this be effective? Will that be effective? They say, no, 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 don't worry about that kind of thing. But, you know, I can't help but fear, you know, when you give these definitions, you know, like, oh, education won't be affected. That's OK. Governments will still be able to provide that. It's so vague that there may be all sorts of services within education that could be privatized, that I'm not sure where this begins and ends, you know. So my fears are still for those very areas that they say are going to be protected. I mean, what do you feel about that? Do you think those are, even those areas are under danger? Uh, yes, I do. We just, just look at the extent of privatization within the United States military. All sorts of... Uh, Functions that used to be performed by the military itself are now performed by highly paid private enterprises. Look at the uh, enormous uh, amount of privatized prisons in the United States. We now have a massive number of privatized prisons. Uh, the contracts require that the prisons be kept full. The inmate population is uh, leased out to private companies for tiny wages, you know, 69 cents an hour, stuff like that. These prison populations are employed producing all kinds of things, uh, military gear, customer service work for corporations. Some of them are making components for Apple Computer. All of this is another lucrative aspect of the privatization. The labor is leased out to private firms, and is not paid. So we could easily have a situation where education is officially provided by the government, and yet all this teaching staff work for some company that the local yeah. education authority is... Yeah, they, hire, they, they will hire a private firm to come run it. Yeah. It's, you know, this has happened extensively in the military. You know, you, you know, it used to be soldiers would have KP duty, that meant kitchen duty. You know, they'd sit there peeling potatoes and... The Army now is all fed under private contracts by private firms. That's just one example. The national health will be privatized, and the government will hire private firms to provide the medical services. And yet they specifically say, no, that's not in danger. And yet the picture that you're painting here is of it being eaten away from inside by all these privatized arrangements. Yeah, never pay any attention to anything a government says. What government has ever kept its word about anything? In fact, 
I challenge you to find one true statement coming out of the United States government in the last 20 years. One. Just <laughs> um, find one. <laughs> I'll have a go, and I, I might get back to you at length. Well, perhaps not. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've covered it, uh, Julian. It's a, a dangerous situation uh, for the West. I think the West essentially no longer exists. Uh, there's a caricature of it, but it's not there. All of its uh, institutions, thing, like civil liberties, things that people fought for for centuries. You know, where it began with, uh, uh, in uh, England with Magna Carta, First, uh, only the aristocracy had any civil liberties, and then over the, year, over the centuries, it gradually gets extended. You get the glorious revolution, 1680, now parliament is supreme, not the king, king subject to law, people are protected by the rule of law. These are massive achievements that took centuries. They're all gone. 9-11 got rid of all of them. Because everything that's happened since 9-11 has been a consequence of that agenda. The latest being the Paris attacks, which has now gotten rid of whatever civil liberties the French had. And the same thing will occur in Britain. I mean, you've already had your post office sold off and mm. privatized. Sure. They can sell the post office. They can sell the national health. Mm. So how can the corporations make money when all the jobs in the West are offshore and nobody has any money? Because... Uh, in the United States, the uh, real median family income has been falling for years. So where is the consumer demand? How do you make money? You can't. The way the corporations make money now is they appropriate the tax revenues. The government hires them to perform public functions and pays them with tax revenues. It's the only way corporations can make money. The banks can make money by extracting economic rents, uh, capitalizing them into debt obligations and collecting interest. But nobody else, there's no other way you can make any money. And if you've got any savings, how can you make any money in your savings? You've got zero interest rates, negative interest rates, stock markets, which are, you've got to be crazy to be in there because uh, it's all a house of cards. It's a gambling casino. Um, nobody can make money. The corporations can't make money. And so they're moving into being paid to perform public operations out of tax revenues. They pay tax revenues. So you've had cities like Chicago that sold off the revenues of their parking meters. And so now uh, some group wants to have a parade in Chicago. They can't get a permit because uh, Chicago can't close the street because it closes the streets. The Private firms that own the parking meters can sue them for loss of revenues. So all of these things are already happening. Yeah. The picture that you're painting here actually ultimately fits very much with what Patrick Wood talks about technocracy, that essentially we're ultimately looking at a power grab, a takeover of everything, so that yeah. nobody is going to be able to do anything but by the say-so of these corporate fascist entities, which are identical, really, with government, just power bases, and that's it. Yeah, they become the government. Like yes. we said, the partnerships make them the government. They're higher than the government. They just own everything. They own the right to make all the decisions. Mm. Uh, you know, courts disappear, parliaments disappear. Who needs a president or a prime minister? You have a technocrat instead. <laughs> well, you have the corporations ruling from the standpoint of their bottom line. Sure. So... We've covered the waterfront. The people need to know this. I'd yeah. like to know if your readers actually believe what we are telling them. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> um, one last thing I will ask you is, do you think there's any chance that the TPP will not go through, or do you think it's just fait accompli? I, I kind of think the French would have protected their food because that's important to them, and that they would have probably blocked it or at least gotten some kind of concession. It might have been a fake concession full of loopholes. But now with these Paris attacks and the way that's playing out, I think that people are just now going to be swept along with whatever comes. I don't, I don't think that the Western people are up to the challenges that they face. So you think the TPP will be fast-tracked through and that'll be that? Yeah. 
Yeah, it will. That's what I think. So, I mean, if that is the case, then what is left for us? Is, is it just a case of organizing boycotts of products and targeting, you know, where you put your investment and consumer unions, depositor unions, you know, fighting back with your with your pound and your dollar? I mean, is that all we're left with? I don't know. It may be that if you boycott something, you're adversely affecting your profits and you may get sued. It's hard to know. I don't think anybody will have any rights but the corporations. Yeah. So probably you can't do anything. Mm. And, and the real question is whether the Russians and Chinese will get caught up in this. Their economists are they're the same as ours. They're all these neoliberal people. And what neoliberal economics does is justify the right of private property to exploit and loot. That's all neoliberal economics is. It's a justification for corporate rule and looting. And so and, and the Russians, uh, they want to be part of the West. So they can be folded into this just from their own misplaced aspirations. Um, the Chinese, I don't know. You know. They want to be rich too. They like all of this billions of being billionaires. And it's unclear whether they, they'll be rolled into it as well. Uh, you know, Russia has these oligarchs, these billionaire oligarchs that are essentially, as far as I can tell, independent of the government. And Putin has not reined them in. I would have thought by now he would have dispossessed them because it's an unfriendly power source. They have adverse effects on the Russian economic prospects. Uh, they probably have political power that can be used against him, against the Russian state. They probably are allies with globalism. These billionaire oligarchs in Russia, they're probably allied with Washington and London. And yet they're there, nothing happens to them. They, what they have, they stole, and they should be nationalized, dispossessed. In fact, they probably should be put in prison. But nothing happens. So I don't know. I think, uh, you know, all of said something about the future being a boot in the human face forever. And this may be the worldwide result, maybe where we're all, where we're all headed. So that may be the face of what has been called for so many years, but now we're justified perhaps in calling the new world order. Yeah, it's the boot in the human face forever. In other words, you can't get it off. You can't. There's no more revolt. But you think there is a chance that it won't go there because of the, the other side of the equation, the BRICS side of the equation? <sighs> if they have the realization, I'm not sure they do. And, you know, if you look the history from the 19th and 20th century, the dominance of the West, and everybody looks to the West. And, uh, Putin seems to be a leader capable of decisions, but he also has these inclinations to be accepted in the West and cooperate with the West, and he keeps calling his deadly enemies his partners. <laughs> I mean, we've made it completely clear we want to destroy him. We even had... Uh, former CIA officials called for his assassination, and uh, John McCain mm. called for his death, and, and he still talks about his American partners. You, you know, for long after the fall of Rome, uh, all the barbarians still sort of worship the Roman emperors. <laughs> and on their coinage, they always had a picture of Caesar. <laughs> because the authority of money was associated with Rome, Caesar. You have these uh, coins uh, from the barbarian kingdoms that fall in Rome, and they've got Caesar on <laughs> So I, I don't know, Jim, I can't say. No, no, sure. But there are still some question marks out there, and perhaps we can, we can hope that there's something lurking behind the question marks that there still are. And, uh, of course, if we are looking at, as you described it with the Orwellian phrase, the, uh, the, the boot on the face forever, and we're looking at that monolithic new world order, then it seems certainly from my perspective that we would be looking only at a transcendent hope, but of course that's something for which this particular station stands for, so I would still hold out that hope to people to look to that transcendent hope. But when you're actually looking at just what's going on in the world today, I think we have to be very much realists, and I thank you ever so much for coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Um, I do hope that people do take very seriously 
what it is that you say and uh, that whatever it is that we can do and maybe it's very puny but whatever it is we can do that we share the information that we have so that people around us are aware of what's going on at that very least I think we need to be aware and I do still believe in the power of sharing information and, and thank you I know that you must do too because you are continually sharing information at your blog paulcraigroberts.org so thank you very much for coming on and it's always great to speak with you well, Jordan, I appreciate your interest in the, the fact that you share your audience with me thank you very much <laughs>